welcome here. Welcome. Buenas tardes. So we're here to, to uh, have a conversation with ourselves and with you about the connections between music and film. Um, excuse me. I think we, in general, approach it from two different positions. Um, I'm a filmmaker who works with musicians. Kike has made films, but he's more of a, his life is music. And um, the way those things fit together is very, very complicated, very interesting. They could be at odds, or they could converse and dance together, yeah. And, and in fact, what, what people say about things like this is, it'll either be great or it's a train wreck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I started out um, doing films with music in them before I understood how this worked. So I thought you'd just grab some records and put them on the soundtrack. I later found out that you can't do that without paying people. <laughs> but that's, what, that's the way I started out. And, um, and so you get to the point now where, in general, when you make a film on a financial level, it's always cheaper to work with a composer. That seems strange. You're hiring a composer. But, but um, the people that control, control music are this, the most greedy people in the world that I've ever met. And so if you, you know, I did a film that had a lot of old recorded music in it, and then I went back to try and clear it. It was going to cost $50,000, which was around half the budget of the film. So at that point, I worked with a composer. And, you know, so that's sort of playing catch up. But now I've come to realize that, you know, I, I always thought composers were a luxury, you know, that only Hollywood could afford to work with them. And that's not true. Um, you know, but again, it, it's a collaboration. You know, it's the chemistry has to work, everything else has to work. The composer has to like you, you have to like the composer. And Kiki and I haven't worked together, but we hope to, and we like each other. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good start. So um, you want to start off by... No, uh, just by saying that my experience of making film for music uh, um, started many, many years ago, and, and there are many ways that somebody who makes music can um, can contribute with uh, making the uh, the story and the narrative uh, deeper, more interesting, and uh, more grabbing. Um, that's I, I think that's that's the role of the, of the music to, to to converse with with the image. And there are many ways that, uh, in, in my experience as a musician, uh, that I've done work either by looking at an image many, many times and try to capture the, the essence, uh, the aura of that image, and try to render some kind of a uh, composition that will help this image to, to go and, and have, add layers of meaning. That's, I think that's, that's the role of, of, of a composer. Or at times, my music has been, uh, Use because somebody likes uh, the things that I do, and, and it sits well with the image and, and, and the ideas that the, the, uh, either the, the the person that is cutting the film in, or or the directors who uh, uh, listen to the music. And at times, uh, uh, the, the composition also it takes place uh, spontaneously, as uh, uh, I participated in. A, it's very dismystifying. One of the first times that I went to Hollywood to do, um, um, a, uh, it was a feature film, fiction film. I was brought into the studio. It was a huge, huge image being projected inside of the studio. And uh, I was just asked to, the image played, and I was asked to perform right away and to not think very much. Uh, and, and start adding all kinds of instruments to this. I thought it was going to be a score or something, but no, it was really on top of the thing. So that's that's another experience. And the and the last experience that I I, I haven't had, but I just um, the Pacific Film Archive just contacted me because they wanna uh, uh, they want that I just, uh, do a track for a silent film. They're gonna have five or seven composers uh, through the National Endowment for the, uh, the Arts grant, and we will we will take a film that is a silent film, and we will create something there and uh, to be performed live in front of an audience, as it used to. My father used to tell me when I was a kid that he would go to the movies in this little theater, uh, movie theater that I lived in the central coast of Chile, and where there was somebody playing the piano 
or, or at times just a violin and somebody was translating, translating the cards as they, they went through the silent films. So I feel that very, that, that will be a, a different type of challenge uh, to perform it, well, to watch it, compose it, and then perform it alive and, and to be in sync with the images. So there are many ways that you, you can contribute to, to the to this uh, evil experience of filming, because I feel that it's a, such a, it's almost in the realm of the magic, as, as in the world of films. Uh, uh, as uh, he knows, uh, you, you are asked a lot. Uh, you, you are asked to sit down, uh, no lights, incredible luminosity in front of you, and all this music and this dialogue. It is that these guys have a really, for them, uh, as a musician, uh, we are more in the, uh, we have to struggle more. You guys, once you, you make the film, is you, you have a hundred percent of attention. So, but that's my experience of making the film. No, but you know, but that brings up a point too for those who are filmmakers and those who aren't is that um, music is collaborative and film is collaborative, and 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 what happens when you work together? There's something emerges that is better than each one of you could do. You know, I I direct films with friends and I work with friends who are composers or editors. And each time, if it clicks, it's wonderful. Um, but you know, going back to the music, um, there's this process when you're thinking about a film and the director or the editor will have an idea. Um, and so normally what you do when you're conceptualizing it is you say, well, this idea for the sort of kind of music I want, so I'll look around and just grab something and put it in. Uh, and that's called temp music. Temporary music, um, and sometimes it's very counterintuitive. You, you, the things you think will work don't work, and then, and then all of a sudden there's a surprise. And you know, sometimes it's ironic. You know, the very famous, I think one of the most famous scenes in Apocalypse Now is where the helicopters are coming in, and you have Wagner's you know March of the Valkyrie, you know, which is has nothing to do with Vietnam, but it has to do with with you know their sense of how powerful they are. And, and what a brutal war it is. So, you know, it's, the film is a, the music is a, is a really insightful comment on the scene, and, and, it, and it is integral. It, it, in general, you know, my, my feeling is that it's, you know, it's wonderful to collaborate with people like this, but a lot of filmmakers don't really sense the power of what you can do with music. It really, it really makes a difference. So, you know, anytime I'm thinking about something that I know is having music in, I, I almost have to be inspired by the music to get a handle on what I'm going to do, you know, even if it's temporary. Um, and then as the film progresses, you know, you don't want to waste the composer's time, so you don't want to, you don't want to have, you know, because it takes months and months and months and months to edit a film, sometimes years. Um, you don't want to hang, up, hang them up, but at a certain point very early on, the earlier the better, you, you start meeting and talking and throwing ideas around and normally what the filmmaker does, I mean, what the musician does, as opposed to, you know, writing a full composition, orchestrating it, recording it for you, you know, it's sort of like editing. You do a sketch, you know, and then you sit down and you discuss it. Well, this, yeah, this is really interesting. Let's play with this a little more. No, you know, let's go somewhere else. So it's, it's a really fascinating process um, if you're up for it, you know. You know, if you, if you go into a film saying, this is what I want, this is what I want, you sort of you you lose all that potential for um, for expanding it. Well, I I I participated in an experience a few years ago where a European composer came with with some images, and um, actually Vicente, uh, the person Vicente Franco is a um, cinematographer from the uh, from the Bay Area, and he had shot the film and they and they brought this film and I created this music. To to two image and it took a long time uh, and there was a person running on the beach and um, and so I, I created this space and and I thought that it really worked it was for me I, I found it beautiful I, I always think that my music is beautiful otherwise I wouldn't make it if I don't feel moved I think nobody will be moved for the things that I do so then I we brought it and we projected and she hated it as it's interesting you see, and, and then she, uh, the, he never made it into the cut, and I took that piece of film, I mean, a piece of music, and, and somebody else heard it, and <laughs> really liked it, and, and, and he worked in another film. So it's, it's not all the time, uh, um, even though you are collaborating, you are, you are thinking about uh, 
with the best of intentions. Uh, the best of intentions don't, don't work all the time. And, and I think one of the things that he was saying about this, this, I didn't study music whatsoever. I have never been trained as a musician. I just play. I was, I'm trained as a historian and as an anthropologist, really. Um, so everything that I know about music, I have read and then I have experienced by making it. And so there is something very important in, in film, either fiction films or uh, documentaries, which is character building up character, and that comes straight, straight from Wagner. The notion that a certain, certain people will have a specific music, certain spaces, spaces will have a specific type of music, so you, 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 you kind of watch the footage and you say, okay, this is, this is gonna be a leitmotif, it's gonna repeat, it's, maybe it's gonna, first, it's gonna be only in one instrument, maybe it will be a full, and then maybe it will be a full orchestra, so we really borrow from from um, opera, really. Uh, that's, that's how you compose a film from opera, that every character has its own, its own um, music, really, and its own tone, and its own, its own depthness. And so that's, it's very much something that has been uh, borrowed from all times into uh, film. Yeah. Yeah, I think at one point we can talk about our favorite soundtracks, but let me just refer you to one film that I love. Um, Fellini did a film called Amarcord. Now, actually, I don't love the film, but the soundtrack was written by a composer, Nino Rota, who also collaborated on The Godfather. Um, the whole soundtrack is two tunes, then an infinite, you know, like um, uh, the Goldberg variations. And each time it's different, and each time it brings something different to it, a different nuance, a different texture, which is, which is really marvelous. Um, <clears throat> maybe we should show some stuff. Okay, let me, let me show you a piece first, uh, which is my clip number one. And let me tell you what it is. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in, because I'm, I'm very interested in context, and, and you know, when you do a film, I'm working on a film in Bolivia, you want it to feel like Bolivia. Uh, but at the same time, it's very hard to build, it's very hard to build a film out of, um, out of that cultural material. You have to sort of integrate it in a wider thing. And I'm always trying to, um, to have those two things uh, talk to each other, to have the composed music talk to the real music. So this is the opening for a film I worked on called The Good War and Those Who Refused to Fight It, which is about World War II and conscientious objectors. And the reason I brought it is because uh, the way this sequence worked was we found a piece of footage that had a song in it. We really liked the song. The song was a comment on what we were doing. And that was the basis for building the music. Um, the song didn't have enough motion. It didn't have, you know, it didn't allow us to switch gears enough. So the composer we worked with took that song and used it as the basis for uh, for the piece. So if we can look at cut number one, this is the the opening. It's a, it's around a four minute opening of uh, the film The Good War. Attack. Let's stand by the ones who are man of the guns and pushing the foe on back. Let's all back the attack. Let's really get tough and give them the stuff for making the axes back. There are many times and places where this American story could begin. It could begin in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, or the Vietnam War. In all of these wars, there have been men who refused to fight because conscience would not allow them to kill another human being. We call them conscientious objectors. Sometimes I think those of us who believe in nonviolence feel ourselves to be a separate breed. And we're wondering if somehow or other we're, you know, not fully human beings or something or other. Let's all be good soldiers and back, back the attack. Of all the wars that America has fought, World War II posed the greatest challenge to conscientious objectors. To most Americans, the choice was clear, democracy or fascism. For instance, I was asked, what's the matter? You like Hitler? I said, look, if you guaranteed me a shot at Hitler, you wouldn't have to draft me. But to shoot at another draftee, one who I don't even know, one who I don't have nothing against? No. The heck with that. When their country called, 
Over 16 million Americans served in the armed forces. A small number, only 42,000 men, decided that the menace of Hitler was not enough for them to betray their most fundamental value. Thou shalt not kill. People say, what would happen if everybody would do what you did? Well, I said, if everybody would do that, there'd be no problem. That's all. Back the attack. Let nobody say there's been a delay because of a home front lack. That's all. Let's all be good soldiers and back. Back the attack. The, 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 the problem of Hitler was infinitely more difficult than the problem of Vietnam for, for a person who was, who was wondering about what to do. And in a certain degree, real degree, in 1941, you were a CO knowing that you didn't have another answer. Not all heroes fight on the battlefield. In the face of criticism and scorn, these men challenged the limits of democracy in wartime and went on to lead the social movements that transformed America in the years that followed. This is their story. I was three years old when World War I ended. I remember the sigh of relief in my town because uh, uh, they wouldn't have to go to war and kill people. So, so that was an attempt to have these two different musical worlds speak to it. You know, the, the upbeat optimism of the period and the sort of the elegiac, memorialized, um, the bittersweet nature of the war. Well, I'd like to show you something. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, asked to do music for a documentary on Paulo Neruda. Uh, uh, and I lived in the coast uh, in Chile two towns from where Neruda has his house, where he wrote most of the poetry. He used to come to my, my elementary school every year and read to us. Uh, I found him so boring. Uh, this old man with a whole bunch of books, he came every year and we have to go and see him again. And so <laughs> little I, I knew about it. And so when I was asked to, to do this music, I, uh, I was totally thrilled. and. So they show me the, the, a lot of the footage and I say, I don't want to see more of this, the, the beginning of the footage of, of the southern part of Chile. I just want to compose something and, and let's try to see if it works. So this is what, uh, that's what I did. I, um, I just saw the lots of footage, different footage, and then I went home, composed uh, something. And, I, and, and here it is, it is the beginning of the film. Maybe we can play it, uh, Jeremy, the, the beginning of this part. And then I'm going to show you something else that it was composed to image. I use instruments from the southern part of Chile where the images come from. It's the trumpets that people in this part of the land play. They're made out of horns of animals. Thank you. 
under the volcanoes. Beside the snow-capped mountains, among the huge lakes, the fragrant, the silent, the tangled Chilean forest. I have come out of that land, that mud, that silence, to roam, to go singing through the world. Neruda's journey began where the rain was born in the peace of southern Chile. Entonces, esta comunicación con la naturaleza y esta melancolía que da este paisaje ha estado siempre conmigo. Es algo natural en mí. Es nada más que eso. Yo soy un producto, pienso que soy un poeta natural. No es con orgullo ni con humildad que lo digo, sino que me, pienso que los poetas tienen que ver directamente con la tierra. He was born Ricardo Eliser Neftalí Reyes Basso Alto in 1904. His mother died of tuberculosis two months after his birth. His father soon remarried and took his family to the muddy town of Temuco, where he found a job working on the railroad. As described in his memoirs, the southern rain and the gentle shadow of his angelic stepmother watched over his childhood. At the beginning of the 1900s, the Mugo was a frontier town, an outpost above Patagonia, populated by the remnants of the indigenous Mapuche people. We can stop here. Neruda called it cheap. So that was, that was. Yeah, well, the challenge also is to make music that yes, yes. Uh, when, when the person is speaking in, in documentary spe specifically, that they don't, you know, they don't overpower. They don't fight. And they don't fight, yeah. So you need to find the instruments, the right instruments to do it. And yeah. a lot of times people will say, oh, I like this song. And, you know, that tends to be very, very problematic, anything with words in it, because which words are you going to listen to? You know, if you're going to put a song in with words, you have to just blow everything else away, you know, because otherwise the words don't mean anything. But that was, this was music that you composed after thinking about it, and then they, they used it. Uh, I, I wanted to play something uh, that was composed to image, maybe, uh, I don't know if, um, is uh, Jeremy behind this? Uh, in the, in the in Los Comandos, Jeremy. So yes, uh, um, this uh, this is something else. This is something very different. This is a film that I made. Uh, I made mice with uh, actually our friend. Uh, was shot by Vicente Franco as well, and uh, directed by Marilyn Franco and me. And this is an idea that I took from uh, Steve Rake, the composer, uh, American Jewish composer. He wrote uh, a, a piece called Other Trains. And uh, the, in this uh, work, uh, it is when he was a, a young man, he, he used to come across uh, from New York to California. They used to send him in trains by himself. This was in the middle of the war, Second World War. And uh, uh, then as he grew up, he, he thought about the, the, the trains that the Jewish people were uh, brought to the extermination camps. And so he wrote this piece inspiring all this using, using the sounds of trains, using the sounds of, that he heard. And so I, I, I stole his idea. I was a political prisoner <laughs> uh, at some point in my life. And, and in this memory park, there is only one memory park uh, in Santiago. And there is a wall of names of uh, people who disappear in this specific concentration camp. It's called Villa Grimaldi. And so um, we were filming with um, uh, Vicente. And so there's this wall of names it's made out of metal. And I decided to be reverent to it, to, to it or just call the spirits of people in the, in the wall of names. So I, 
I call a friend who is a very noted percussionist from Chile, and we bang in a constant rhythm the wall of names with everything we could. I took fragments that I found uh, the, 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 the torture house has been demolished, and I found fragments in, in a box somewhere in, in the back of... And so I took all the fragments and, and I put them and we filmed them and we projected them. Then I brought the, that soundtrack, which is continuous 17 minutes. Uh, we brought it here to Fantasy and with... Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Jim Lebrecht from uh, Berkeley Sounds. We added many, many other sounds to the soundtrack. So this is something that you can, we are going to see. And the other thing also about the evilness of, of, of music and, and film is that um, we use 5.1, it's called the, the technicality, where you are surrounded by these sounds and, and, and we place them as, as we are mixing the, the film. We, we put the drum in front of you, or the violin in, front, in the back of you, as a, to engulf you with this sound, so you pay 100% attention to what's going on. So this is what, I don't know if we have 5.1 here, probably not, but uh, this was cut in that way. So let's, let's play a little bit. With that. <laughs> That seems to be seamlessly integrated. You, you, you can't even tell what's the real thing, what's the performance. It's, it's really fits as one piece. Well, that's that's also the job of the engineers or the people who are helping in the mix because Jim is such a such a master. On, you know, you work with him. Well, it's the, it's the mixer, it's the composer, it's the editor. It was Michael Chandler's incredible editor. And, yeah. And 
and somehow something wonderful comes out of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, moving right along. Uh, music does a couple other things, too. It does a lot of things. Uh, one of the things is that um, documentary film has, you know, since it's not done from a script and since it's composed in the editing room, it has, it has um, problems in holding together, you know. It, it, sometimes it feels very fragmented, very rough, depending on how it's shot, depending on how you're integrating other materials. So <clears throat> I want to show you, <clears throat> just by way of illustrating that, I'm, I'm working on a film right now on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is a sketch for a two-minute opening. We're gonna look, I want to show you the two minutes without the sound and then with the sound. OK, let's look at uh, cut number two, ITA open, no music. When I working with Jewish organization Beit Salem, it gives us cameras to protect ourselves from, you know, settlers. Muslims are here, but this is a Jewish area. So, uh, you know, when it's when God wants to take someone back, he'll he'll take someone. When we leave, we lose. أنا يعني بنات أخي بعد ما إنه علموهم بيتسلم كيف يصوروا وأعطونا الكاميرا علموني كيف أصور لأنه الواحد بيش ممكن إنه حدا يكون موجود I screamed and the camera fell from my hand I was really scared and gave the camera to my brother to continue filming. We didn't give out 100 video cameras to document rotten apples. It was just to show that there was something systematic happening. Um, it was almost structural to the occupation. אני סלם בצלם, ועבר ארץ... אפשר לדבר איתך? תקשיב טוב, אתה סלם בצלם? אוקיי. גם אתה עצור. אוקיי, נסתכל על הקליפ עכשיו. הקליפ הזה עם המוזיק. ואז נסתכל על הקליפ ונתקל כמה שאלות וקליפים. נסתכל על הקליפ הזה. לפני שנתקל על הקליפ, אני רוצה לדבר על הקליפ הזה. זה קליפ מאוד מעניין, אבל זה לא מרגיש שזה 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 מרגיש is hard, but the beginning and the end are the hardest. So this is, this is definitely a work in progress. So let's look at the beginning with a little bit of music. <laughs> When I working with Jewish organization Beit Salem, it gives us cameras to protect ourselves from, you know, settlers. Muslims are here, but this is a Jewish area. So, uh... You know, when it's when God wants to take someone back, he'll he'll take someone. So when we leave, we lose. أنا يعني بنات أخي بعد ما إنه علموهم بيتسلم كيف يصوروا وأعطونا الكاميرا علموني كيف أصور لأنه الواحد بيش ممكن إنه حدا يكون موجود. I screamed, and the camera fell from my hand. I was really scared and gave the camera to my brother to continue filming. We didn't give out 100 video cameras to document rotten apples. It was just to show that there was something systematic happening. Um, it was almost structural to the occupation. Wow. 
אני סלם בצלם, בוא, בוא, רוצה, אפשר לדבר איתך? טוב, אתה סלם בצלם, גם אתה עצור. אני רוצה לדבר איתך. Music can become a very critical element in, in telling the story. Um, let's, let's open it up now. Do people have any questions or specific issues they'd like us to address? Because we can just go on all afternoon. Any questions, comments? Any mysteries? Yeah? Yes? Yes, please. Well, it's part of budgeting the whole film. You know, um, and, you know, and, and again, you know, back to this issue of people not taking music seriously. Yeah, you'll have um, $75,000 to shoot stuff and you'll have $5,000 to compose the music. So <laughs> take it or leave it. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know how you work. A lot of times when I talk to composers, I'll say, well, this is an hour show and I think there'll be maybe 10 or 15 minutes or 20 cues. You know, we sort of figure that out that way. Is that And the other thing too is, given the documentaries are always underfunded, you know, naturally the, the music you have for the composer is, is not as much as, as they deserve, as, as what their worth is, work is worth. So what, what you do frequently is, you know, I should be paying you two or three times this month, but I'll, I'll make a suggestion. If you compose the music and let me use it for the film, you will own the music and you can remix it, you can put it out on your own CDs. And I won't have any rights to it apart from the rights to, uh, to use it in the film. And that, you know, that makes it a little easier for people to work for less than they're worth. Yeah, I mean, documentaries and feature films, uh, fiction is uh, very, very different. They, they exist in different planets because uh, uh, as, as far as I know, le uh, there is kind of an established price if, if it's a PBS documentary, for example, if it's an HBO documentary, there is so much money, more or less, that musicians have arrived to a negotiation with a film with the filmmakers um, or uh, or as you say we can negotiate it we can make a CD of that music etc etc uh, and also depends on the musicians how, how you know how established the musicians are but in in, in Hollywood I, I spent a week doing music uh, it was an obscene amount of money I thought that was totally obscene I, I didn't deserve that money in a way <laughs> Compare with that you have to do documentary films, and then they're paying you uh, in a, in, a, in a week where you well that's make that's obscene months. too. What you make for documentary films is so bad. Um, so it is very there's a lot of disparity in in that. But the truth of the matter is that it's still cheaper. Very if if you hire a composer because the right the thing is. A lot of the music in the past, I, I'm talking about 12, 10 years ago, because the business have changed completely. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we as musicians, it was almost impossible to make a record and put it ourselves. We had to go to, through companies, otherwise you couldn't make really the CDs before. And so you ended up giving the rights of the music to somebody else. And so when, when you wanted to use the music, for example, they, they were charging you $50,000, but most of the money went to the companies who put the music out. And yeah, very the musicians little, and composers. And very little to the musicians who, and the composers who made it. In the past 15 years, these things have changed completely because we as musicians, with a very little, small computer, we can make records in our own studios. And so we own now the rights, and therefore we can negotiate better prices for and make more money in the end. <laughs> by, by making ourselves the music and require ourselves. And in, in the end, I think uh, a lot of companies have closed down and because musicians have taken their, with, digi with the digital age, we, we have taken the, the, the material in, and, and we own 100% of the rights, which was unheard of before. And one last comment on that, because I have to buy music. Um, when you buy music, you don't just buy music. You buy three different things. You buy the right to the composition, which is called Uh, the publishing rights, you buy the right to put it with the film, which is called sync rights, and you also buy the right to the master recording. So you're paying three different times. So if you have, if you own all those, 
then they have, you know, maybe you can make a deal, but you'll make more than you would if you were the composer. Yeah. Um, so that's the sort of, we can talk about money forever, but you know, <laughs> this is about art, I hope. So other questions or comments? Yes. Um, I was wondering in the movie that you just showed, whether that was a composer that wrote that music, or was it? That is an example of temp music. Uh, you know, because, I mean, as I said, openings are really hard to, to figure out, and I have worked on films where you've gone through 20 different openings, so, so it, it can be a waste of your money and the composer's time to have them score each different thing. So that's just something I grabbed to see, well, is this, the kind of feeling I want, you know, it had a little bit of an Arab flavor, it had some drama in it. Uh -huh. Maybe that's gonna work, maybe it won't work. I don't know. You know maybe we'll have a string quartet. So, so um, no, that, that's just music I, I borrowed I okay. for, for the edit. I think it worked. <laughs> other, other questions or comments? Um, if not, let me show you one more thing. Uh, Tika said um, that frequently he will respond to, um, he, will res he will create music that responds to the images, to the feeling. Uh, this is a clip which we had some music and the filmmakers were responding to the music, which is just the opposite. Now, in a way, that's what they do in MTV, so, but this isn't quite that. So can we show the clip? Uh, this is the closing to a film that I made a few years ago called Race is the Place. And one of the performers who did the closing song is Michael Franti, who's a Bay Area performer. And we loved the song. It said what we wanted to say if we could combine it with the right images. So we took his song, and that was what we used as the basis to cut the piece. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, 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 gentlemen. And the things they teach and work for the last 500 years. War just messing up the atmosphere. Born Muslims, born Jews, born Christians and Hindus. A whole lot of people saying kill them all. We got a war on Mumia, Abu Jamal. The war on pop is the one that's fair. The war that's filling up the nation's shield. World War I, two, three, and four. Chemical weapons, biological war. Bush War One and Bush War Two. We got a war for me, we got a war for you. We can't stop it when the beat just drops. If we don't stop, we can't stop it with the rebel rock. Till we hit those heights, and we don't stop. We can't stop because we love this life. Whoa, yo, yo, yo! Don't stop, stop. So, so that's the filmmaker's response to the musician. So it can work either way, or you know, it, it can also work back and forth. You know, we're we're playing off each other's ideas. I uh, just to say something about uh, the film that we made with Marilyn Milford. It, uh, it, you can watch the film in iTunes. It's, in, it's called Archaeology of Memory, and that's uh, the music that has the wall of names. The, the music is, is a f I think it's a 55-minute uh, film that was played in PBS uh, for, I think, for a couple of years. And so you can watch that and see the entire s sequence of, of the wall of names in, in that film. That's a film that's inspired by your music, really. That is to say that the core of, the core of this film is a, a suite, a, an elegy, a, a, you know, a, a response to what happened in Chile. You know, that's, that's, so the whole film is really, you know, the film would have nothing to do with anything if, it wasn't, if your music wasn't there, because that's what the film is. Yeah. It, it is about composing the music, actually. 
Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been lucky about it because a few years ago, uh, there was uh, somebody in the dentist in Chile, uh, who's, a, who's a director, and the, com and, 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 the, and the dentist was playing some music, and it was my music. And he loved the music as he was <laughs> in this session. And then he called me. So I'm scoring this film, uh, a new film that he's making because uh, he heard the music. So uh, I'm been lucky because he has some. Ah, OK. Uh, thank you. He has um, uh, always people have told me that I, can, I tell stories with, with the music that I do. So um, yeah, I've been lucky that people pay attention to the music and, and put it to, to images, for sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Maybe we talk too much. Yes. Well, the, that's what back to what I said. The music business is extremely commercial. It's extremely complicated. Although, as you said, it's getting better. But if you want, if you want a popular song, don't even think about it. On the other hand, royalty-free music doesn't tend to. You're looking for something special, and royalty music-free music tends to be what we used to call elevator music. You know, it's really pretty bland and neutral. Uh, and I think that's a mistake also to maybe get enamored with that music because uh, it will be maybe impossible to really obtain it. And so, so I know that our sites with, uh, will uh, cinematographer, I mean, uh, filmmakers ask if, if you want to, does somebody wants their music to be put to films? And so there are also interchanges, you know, because if it's a new composer, a young composer, and wants to be exposed with it, so you can find matches about also, in my case, as I got older, uh, specifically with young people, I've, I've given a lot of rights to young people to use the music because uh, I remember being young and, and having opportunities. People, older musicians uh, hire me. <laughs> you know, I was 14 and then I was playing with 25 year olds, so why not now? So I give also rights to a lot of musicians, uh, filmmakers uh, use my, my, my music for free because I think it's, that's the way it should be. Sure. But let me add something to that in terms of the, the money side again. Um, when you buy rights to music or to still photographs or art, you know, every single image in that clip had to be paid for. Um, when you buy rights, you buy them for specific uses and for specific time periods. So a lot of times what documentary filmmakers or low budget filmmakers do is, you know, the bigger the audience, you know, broadcast television costs one thing, theatrical TV costs another. The bottom of the list is what's called festival use. And you know, when, you make a, when you make a film, you enter in festivals to get prizes and to meet distributors. So, so you know, you pick the bottom end of the scale, you don't pay top dollar. Uh, and, you know, they, it, I don't know exactly, how, you know, music's sold differently than film. Film is show, sold by the second. So, you know, so you can, if there's a song you like, that's outrageously expensive. It's possible, not sure, but it's possible that if you pick the festival level of rights, you usually get a better deal. So that that's a strategy, you know. And again, you know, it's, you didn't have to used to buy federal uh, film festival rights. Used to be free. Now they're not. You know, the, ten years ago when the internet started to become popular, everyone thought there was a lot of money, so they were going to charge a lot of money for internet rights. It turns out that, you know. <laughs> There's money in the internet if you're, you know, if you're a content aggregator like uh, Netflix, but usually not for an individual filmmaker. Anybody else? No, I think. Are we doing on time? Did we, have we gone over? Um, sorry. Uh, if anyone wants to talk afterwards, we'll be glad to to chat or you know. Discuss other things. Anyway, thanks. Thanks very much for coming. Well, thank yeah. you for inviting us. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Kike and Rick for, for coming here and sharing all their information and showing you their clips. And uh, don't run off yet. As a token of appreciation from the Albany Film Fest, 
for you for being a, a, a judge as well as a guest, Rick and Kike for being one of our special guests. Thank you very much for being here today and sharing all your information and your film clips. Thank you. Thank you very much.